Well, let me begin this by thanking Karen O, oh, who signed up to make an automatic monthly donation, and uh, Theodora, who's made multiple, and this is a repeat donation. Thank you very much, uh, ladies. Uh, hugely appreciated. Uh, as we go along here and try, <laughs> try, trying to maintain our even, you know, uh, level. Uh, um, yeah. Today we have a question, a discussion from way back, and I think uh, John probably thought that I uh, had lost him, had decided not to do a, uh, uh, to, to do a response to his question about drawing, especially as it pertains to my drawing. Uh, I am beginning to feel a little bit, uh, uh, you know, self-indulgent, I guess. Um, you, you know, maybe the less you think of these drawings, <laughs> the more you'll think, no big need, Paul. <laughs> anyway, uh, but I say self-indulgent in the sense that we have uh, shown a bunch of my paintings, and now I'm showing a bunch of drawings. Um, and um, it, my my goal in everything I do here is to try to to bring across a certain way of thinking and working uh, and uh, sort of be a, you know, a, what would you call it, a uh, uh, sort of the, uh, an exponent, I guess is the right word, of a particular way of working. We call it Impressionism. Other people have other names for what they do, but um, Impressionism, because we defined it in the, in the Gamel sense. Gamel was my teacher um, of long time standing who wrote the book uh, Twilight Paint Point of View, which would be must reading for anybody, uh, but those particular three chapters or so on academic and impressionist uh, are really worth your time. But it gives you that 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 <clears throat> concept of the impressionist mind, or the impressionist way of thinking uh, that's different from simply broken color of Monet. Uh, so, uh, in any case, uh, since you know that, I you know it makes some sense for me to show my work in, uh, at times, but. In particular, John O. asked me to talk about my drawing experience, and he wanted me to show drawings. And uh, I apologize, John, if I, that isn't quite the phrasing you used, but um, for some reason I didn't include that again in my, in my uh, list of questions, so I don't have the question exactly right, probably, but it's pretty close. So I'm going to show you my work right from the beginning at the Art Students League. And I say not the beginning of the beginning, but, but a certain phase, you can see what sort of thing was going on at the Art Students League. And I think to do that, I'm going to show you, I'm going to get us a nice uh, bright marker. Might be easier. Yeah, there we go. To fly across the screen. But I was one of those guys raised in the construction drawing model. And um, I'm just going to do a rather chain of consciousness thing here, just running through uh, drawings and my evolution. Maybe it'll mean something to you. Uh, I'll try to uh, show you what it's meant to me as time's gone by. But at the Art Students League, the, um, at, in the Hale class, <clears throat> which was uh, also, well, you'd say it was an anatomy class, but it actually just was a model all day, every, or half a day, every day, three hours a day, whatever. And we, uh, we drew and drew, and uh, really, I never saw anything like what you call formal instruction of any sort, um, unlike what I got to Gamble, that was, which was very much directed and academically directed. Um, but uh, so what we were doing was construction drawing, which <clears throat> uh, has everything to do with chunking on a whole bunch of angles. I, I, <laughs> you, you hear me uh, sort of disparagingly describe it from time to time, but you could, if you look at the left group, you can see the angularity sort of model, ang angle, 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 angle. So by the way, now this would have been probably after a year there that I would have been doing these drawings. I, I've lost track of the notebooks from the earliest times where, you, you know, I, I barely was able to get chunks down. So this is a year's worth of doing that and trying to sort out how to draw. This is my friends, uh, John, uh, when I got tired of drawing the model or the model didn't have a good uh, look, I would uh, draw somebody who was in the drawing class with me. These couple faces, these guys here all show us uh, those people. Uh, you know, it was some funny mixture by this time of blobbing and, and angles. Um, Eventually, not too far hence, I start using using becoming independent and uh, started using a, a linear, a more linear approach. But uh, you can see I'm almost like a caricaturist in the way I'm marking these guys out. Um, 
So let's see, go to the next one. Uh, so this is where you can see me beginning to think in terms of long distances. That points and angles thing that Sargent talks about was much more my happening with me here and more, more I found it more effective, uh, even though I still wasn't uh, putting emphasis on uh, uh, line in, a, in, a, in, the, in the more beautiful sense of that word eventually that I, that I eventually studied. It was really much more about the shape of the figure and the shapes and the proportions and all those sorts of things. But with, without uh, understanding the magnificence of line as, a, as, as an aesthetic, as a beautiful uh, phenomenon. So, um, yeah, we had a couple. These, these, the two outside guys and the middle guy uh, were two of my favorite models. The middle guy was a, um, a dancer, I want to say from, um, you know, had some significant experience in New York. And, uh, but anyway, uh, both, uh, both posed well and, and had... Uh, uh, figures that were were um, were solid were were nice. Now this is charcoal drawing, and uh, even though I'm showing it to you and you've seen it before, this is literally was what we did with Gamel. This is as soon as I got to Gamel, it all became about uh, much I think, more comprehensively about masses and outlines and particular sh really shape making, and it began to look more like objects in a very quick fashion. I mean, this probably took me I don't know how long it might have taken me as much as two weeks or something. Uh, just charcoal, and then Gamel finally, as I got to the end, had me go, I say just charcoal, it was charcoal and, red, and white chalk. And then uh, toward the end, he had me throw in a little bit of color, just t told me to mass out the big reds and sort of get a be little better idea in my mind about how good the composition was or whether it was good. So, um, and then, it, of course, with Gamel, we were doing charcoal uh, figures pretty pretty much right away, right after the cast. And uh, so that became the, the steady thing, the steady diet. The three years I had in New York, I'd never take, uh, I would never, I would never um, uh, give up for anything. I'm, I'm very pleased that that was able to be uh, there for me. As you heard me say before, I recommend that model of draw, 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 and draw, and draw, and uh, and then take instruction uh, rather than trying to follow somebody's advice from the beginning. Maybe that I'd have to say that most people might wind up doing that anyway. So, uh, but so the one on the right was one of the very first figures I did with Gamel, and you can so that you can see the academic uh, look. And then the one on the left is my uh, is my uh, attempt in charcoal, of course, to um, to 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 find best practices. You know, literally, we you can get a figure going, but what is really the most logical and best practice to get a figure going and to more comprehensively handle it? And that's when I started becoming rather rather visual, um, whereas before I've been drawing objects drawing the shadow line, masking the shadow line flat, uh, and getting the big three values, like the shadow, the light, and the background, and then turning form. Academic model. These were pencil drawings done at that time, and uh, I'm feeling pretty silly. This is like a slideshow. I didn't really <laughs> mean to do that, but here you are, John. <laughs> um, these are all over. The photographs have exaggerated the, 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 the littleness of this, you know, the, the contrast between little marks. So that some of these things don't look like they otherwise might. Uh, but these two are done in the classroom in Gamels. These were three-day drawings where the charcoal drawings were two-week drawings. I think they were nine-day drawings, actually, uh, or roughly not ten, ten, ten day, intended to be ten-day. Usually it would wind up about nine days with all our messing around with posing. And then, uh, and then on the right is a later drawing, quite a few years later. It's still pencil, though, and I'm drawing a, a, a portrait of my son who uh, looked bored that day and was very willing to sit. He was reading a book, I think. Pretty typical thing. Now, this is another use of drawing. That is to say, I copied in red chalk, I copied this, um, the, a Raphael. And this is this is my copy of the Raphael. I should have dug up the original for you so you could actually compare it, but <clears throat> a photograph of it. But um, this is where I recommend uh, copying when you have a purpose. And the, my purpose was to try to get my head around his touch. And it wasn't very far into it that I realized I was beginning to own the mind, that is to say, that, that aesthetic, that, that, that something in my muscle actually changed. And I was able to actually make marks that had that quality, but I began to realize what the touch was of Raphael. And that's all I'd copied this for. I just really didn't like my clunky mark making, probably as shown up in those, in those uh, you know, in these uh, drawings right here. Wouldn't be surprising. So uh, that's one reason to do it. I tried to... Um, uh, do things like this with a reason copying. I try not to copy, just copy for copy's sake. Um, I hate wandering around all over the place uh, and you copy one guy and then you get something and copy somebody else and pretty soon you know what in the world are you doing? 
So I copy usually for information from looking for information, like about touch. I copied this guy. I copied uh, an Ang and I copied a Rubens with the same thing in mind. Uh, yeah, so these are also, uh, the one on the left is a charcoal, the one on the right is a pencil. These were all done uh, probably just a little post my days with Gamel. Uh, the one on the left was inspired by, uh, it, was a, it was a sleeve turned out from inside a coat, and it was, and it was a, uh, just a opportunity to do one of those little kind of studies that you see a lot of different painters doing from particularly Da Vinci and, <clears throat> da Vinci and uh and uh, Degas, but also you see one, some of these studies by um, uh, Leighton. The one on the right is a pencil drawing of a, of a cast of a hand, uh, the flayed hand. Um, that hand was, was in plaster, so it's, so it's set in plaster, and I decided to try to, I'd never drawn a cast in, with a pencil before. And uh, so that was also part of the time when I, was, when I was coming up with the visual order that you saw in the flayed figure itself. And uh, but that you, if you want to call this drawing, these are these are these are um, a version of grisaille that uses very little white. It's mostly uh, it's just using a <clears throat> thinned version of gray. I think it was I think I probably used gray in both of them. And, but it was just like a thinned version of gray, and then I would just use the canvas to lighten it mostly. Probably a few spots where you'll see white in there, but it's a version of a grisaille, and it's it's very thin and. The idea is to paint over it. The one on the right I did because um, because um, someone had a cast. And yeah, this is a bronze cast, and I'd never done that before, so I thought that was an interesting thing. I thought I might use it for a picture. So I did a nice copy. It was a good copy, full of information kind of copy. Um, <clears throat> and, um, and then I've used it for reference once or twice, but I've never actually tried to do anything with this this rectangle. I'd probably copy it again if I was going to do a grisaille. Now, I didn't do these, as I said, I don't, the way, our way of working wasn't grisaille, but this is a kind of drawing with oil paint, with black and white drawing with oil paint. It's different from painting with black and white uh, paint, you know, with like opaque paint. This is actually uh, really living on the uh, transparent, uh, uh, with a transparent medium from one end to the other. Now this is a charcoal drawing demonstrations that I that where I'm showing people how I approach uh, drawing. The one on the right is the much more evolved one, but the, you can see the, da the the drawing is really damaged. Um, you know, I just didn't take particularly good care of it. I did a uh, video. It was my first video. I was done with that thing, and the and the uh, film went bad. Um, it was uh, one of those oh, what do you call it? VHS tapes and. Um, I don't know if I just used bad quality or what, but I could never get it to play uh, play back. Maybe some expert could at some point. I think I still have the tapes around somewhere. But um, it was 14 hours of um, you know of a drawing lesson with conversation. Uh, but you know that would have started. And by the way, this one again, the the marks are way too dark and light, dark and light. They're they're much less uh, aggressively looking like ink marks or something. So if you're trying to learn anything from this, but this is roughly the way you see me approach a, a drawing like that, or this way too, you know, where you see me set up a, a reasonable top that actually has visual content and a reasonable bottom. So that's what you're seeing down here and here, that's the bottom. And then this element of this into this with some of this, that's all what I'd call the top. And then all the rest of it begins to evolve after that. Um, you know, I left, I left the whole idea of um, getting widths to go with those heights and all that sort of thing. Uh, but that's charcoal, uh, and that gives you an idea of the approach. This this kind of a charcoal, um, <clears throat> I typically start it without using the darkest darks in their inky state. I usually try to go around and get a lot of the uh, values moving because these, these are all charcoal on white. So I try to get the shapes moving at a low contrast where I'm not digging right into the charcoal and then I have to move a, a light, say, like this area here, have to move it into the dark. Uh, those sorts of things are sort of problematical if you're trying to keep a beautiful white surface of the canvas, paper rather. Um, and so there are very different kinds of drawing. One of the things I try to get people to do is think about it. Go and make a list of at least five different purposes for drawing. But um, this is memory drawing. These were uh, done with probably 2H pencils. I must have dug into the paper to even get that to show up. But we had a model one day and uh, this day went so dark we decided to go ahead and get a put artificial light on the model. And uh, you can see my evolution. I think I was, and by, uh, by the way, this one is looking down from above. We had the guy stand on, lean on the bottom of the stairs on the, on the newel post. 
And so this is looking down. So that wasn't a challenge in itself. Um, but these were 10 minute looks. So, and I saying that to challenge you actually for, for those of you who actually uh, want to make an investment in using your memory. Um, it's, it's, I've always found it to be a hugely beneficial thing. The idea of concepts is, is entirely linked. The, the one, when I say I angst, I, you have to have a concept of the thing fixed in your mind and I, or you've been pushing shapes around all day long, that's in that world of memory that we're talking about. But it's not strict memory, it's, but this is, but <laughs> this indeed is. So it, what's nice about the lighting, it was simplistic. So it was really just mostly a harsh shadow line, a little bit of turning form and a flat shadow. Uh, with all these things. I think this was the first one I did. I think this was the third one. I don't know where these two land. And this was, uh, actually this is a different night, a different different model, different day. Uh, but that's the kind of stuff you can do with memory drawing. As I said, with a pencil, it's a two-edged pencil. These drawings, I can't remember. I think these drawings are no more than four or five inches high. So that's one of those efficiencies, right? So if you're drawing a big old thing, you're not going to probably, uh, even if you memorize it, you're probably going to have more difficulty with it. Although it'd be worth, I'd love to see the adventure of somebody trying it. I'm sorry that these can't be any darker, but they were really fairly light uh, things. Uh, it's interesting, you can actually see that they each have their light effect produced by the flatness of the shadows largely and whatever squareness of edge uh, is, is appertains to that. You know, one of the things we did with that, you know, this is the side, this, this dark on this leg right here, for example, or over any place you see these lines, that would have represented, the dark of that arm would have represented the dark of the wall behind him, which gave it that strong silhouette. But it wasn't a massing problem. We tried to stay within the figure itself just to have time to do the memory stuff. So these lines became conventions. They became a stand-in for that value. And you can see that clearly here. But if you get that, <clears throat> if you get that line dark enough, it'll begin to represent the, the light effect at an edge. So, uh, and you'll see that happening in each of these. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. That was fun stuff, very challenging and very emboldening too, in a certain way. Uh, now this is where you have, so those are 10 minute poses. This, these are one minute poses. And uh, you can see I struggled and mightily didn't get much in the first pose. And this is pose number two. If I didn't number them, but I could have. This is pose number three. What he would do is he would take the pose and hold it as long as he could. And it turned out to be about a minute. But I just told him, he, I just didn't want him to move out of the pose. So as soon as he knew he was going to move, just drop it. And he did. He was holding onto a rope, leaning way back. We had him doing that uh, so that we, we, we marked where his feet were going to be. And we had him holding that pose way back so that it would be classically one that you couldn't otherwise hold. It would be impossible to hold that by itself without a rope or something. So, so you can see this is probably number four or five. And then wherever this one lands, I don't know where. And then this one here was a, one of those drawings. Then I then I memorized and tried to correct the drawing itself. Uh, looking at it now, it looks like I actually missed the center on this one, the center should be lower. It's funny you don't get those things as you start getting greedy for all the li memorizing little stuff. You know, you don't, you don't necessarily keep fresh on your larger relations. Anyway, for what it's worth. Um, now these were done that way though. They were done as not much more than outlines. The model would pose uh, for a minute and we did nothing but just take, had him take the pose for a while. These might've been more than a minute even, but we didn't draw till he sat, uh, sat down. And then, uh, and then he would uh, uh, he would he would rest. We would draw. He would take the pose again as soon as we were finished trying to you know with what we couldn't remember anymore. And that's so it went. And I I wouldn't tell you that any of these poses were done in the course of a of a of an afternoon. They wouldn't have been going on for weeks or anything like that. Um, but you can see that at some point along the way here, I start getting much more. Th and thanks to memory drawing, I got much more invested in the beauty of line. Uh, and um, as much as I as much as I am not there yet, that's one of those benefits of memory drawing. It's also one of the benefits of just simply drawing uh, with the intention of being precise. But you you begin to see the kind of stuff I was doing as part of my training. I wanted to show you this because one of the things we did with memory was this is the figure you just saw a little bit ago, the one that I sort of sat there and noodled up noodled to death by turning it into a piecemeal. <laughs> we all did that kind of thing. Uh, but one of the things we, I just found this, I didn't realize I had this, but there's a uh, study. So this would have been done after class. And I would have gone and picked up a piece of, this would have just been old typing paper. And it would have tried to draw that figure from memory. 
period, pure and simple. That was the assignment. And again, this wouldn't have been very big. It might have been four inches high. This this here is about 11 inches high, I think. Um, and uh, so there are parts to that figure, just different things that I thought I could remember. Uh, and how well I did it is, you know, anybody's guess. One of the things I do recommend when you do this is try to keep a less ambiguous line, f keep f fuzzy out of it, keep coming over and cleaning up your line, draw a simpler line. You'll see how that works out in a little bit. Now, the other use of the memory, and this is another form of drawing, if you want to put it that way, but this is pencil just used as if it were mass drawing. But I went to a, 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 a performance at, um, I think, the conservatory in Boston, um, and uh, where students could get in for a dollar or some odd thing like that. There was so much cultural opportunity there. But these would be elite performances or performances by graduate students and that sort of thing. So here's a cellist and a, a pianist. And all these were memorized in, a, in the same night. I memorized all these different things and went home. And uh, I don't remember if it's the same night or the next day that I put all this memory together of that night. I'd put a lot of time into learning this and then uh, had memories of, you know, just whatever. But I particularly got a kick out of the way this, this cellist would stick his tongue into the corner of his cheek. <laughs> um, this is a quick shot of, a, um, of the... Um, um, of the director bowing and uh, someone in the audience here and here. Uh, unless this was a musician at a different time, I can't remember. This was definitely somebody I was right, sitting right in front of me and had the most curious Degas-like uh, uh, odd uh, shapes. So that's, that's drawing done with the purpose of actually expressing a... Um, it's mass drawing with the purpose, purpose of expressing... Uh, 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 the visual impression of a, a memory of a night. The other use of memory that we did is all again with, we'd start if not hang with just 2H pencils. I was in the range of being F to 2H to HB typically uh, in doing these kinds of drawings, but I, wherever it came from, I was already there in love with Velasquez, and these are memories of his memorable heads, very truthful heads done by Velasquez. And this is an ang over here, and this one I did with the idea of putting down the square first, right? Now these were done without any marks of any kind. In the old days, we would do grids to up and you know sh draw a line through here and that way. In these cases, I just drew the head, and this would have been drawing maybe number three or four, uh, you know, attempt. And I would by this time I was getting down to looking instead of looking ten minutes at these things, I wouldn't be. I would start confusing myself after a um, just a couple minutes. So most of the time, you'd see me do a two or three minute look. And then uh, the rest of this would be follow follow up. This looks like a middle stage one uh, where you know I hadn't gotten to the point of being able to remember much. I did what I could remember. But um, yeah, when I first did this, I must have done 20 or 21 drawings um, on the first one. And then after that, it would gradually, I'd get to the same place with fewer and fewer drawings. Finally, I was getting to the point where I couldn't put much more information after three looks. So I'm just gonna tell you that that's, this isn't me being a genius at all. And uh, I'm just saying, that uh, there's a benefit in memory work, and uh, and it just it's just a matter of staying in the game and, and self improving. You see what I mean? All right. So um, uh, yeah, and these were done from photographs. Um, those were done from photographs from paintings. These were done from photographs from newspapers. And I would just pick ones that had a reasonably clear uh, lighting. Uh, but you get the idea. I've shown you some of these before, if not all of them. But you can see that I'm evolving from this one to this one to this and getting more information and getting more accurate proportions by the time I get to this one. I think this one, I think I have five different versions of that one as I get closer and closer to what I want. You can see the struggles, you know, between this and this and finally getting to here. So, you know, the nice thing about it is they're crispy shapes, the nice crispy dark shapes, darks, 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 good spots. So they make for, for very good... Uh, uh, Velasquez style uh, drawing, which is basically called mass drawing, uh, spot drawing, whatever, uh, not outlines of objects and then noodling, so just much simpler. And then, uh, so this one you can see is also just done with a uh, crude implement. And um, that one I, yeah, that might have been my first attempt to actually do one without a, um, without any s supporting grid or anything like that, which was the Madame Cave method as taught by Gamble. 
I don't know if I can really show you these. This is just another group of heads from photography. And you can see that I'm evolving, eventually get to that head. But this at least gives you the idea of how I did this. Um, you know, getting the tilt right is rather a, an interesting thing, you know, and, and um, when you're not using a grid or something like that, or you don't have a frame. But most photographs from a newspaper do come with a square around them somewhere, so you can find vertical, and that's the key to, to getting tilts. This is crude as it is. This was a first memory of a portrait I was working on. Uh, <laughs> it's very crude. But there's the rectangle. All of this is, I was trying to remember the proportion of the rectangle and the masses and blah, blah, blah. There's not much information there, but I, I'm sure I kept evolving that. Now, the one that's most interesting is this one here, where these are blinks. I've mentioned this to you all before, but the fly, birds don't hold still. And so once you've attuned your eye to seeing shape without thinking, in other words, just seeing and holding, um, and Gamble implied, in fact, that he, he believed that that was the strategically best way to, 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 uh, to learn to memorize. You just close your eye, just, just see it and close your eye and see if it's there. See if you can read it. See if you can put time into looking at it. Um, and so, uh, and, but that's, I mean, don't be, hold me to saying that's exactly the way I worked every time or anything. But these birds would sit out there <clears throat> above where we lived. I believe that was somewhat, so another roof over there. And they would hang around, hang around, chirping away. These are pigeons. And they would just turn, you, they wouldn't hold still for a second. It was just a, you, you look at them and you had to close your eyes right then because they would move. And so if you wanted to hang on to that. So I, would, I was doing that and trying to hang on to the number of bumps and the location of the bumps in relation to each other. And it's just a general impression just of a silhouette. And these would be all in similar things as the bird took off or, and, and so on. But whatever. So you can use drawing in many ways. These drawings are done from photos just to get an idea. I was trying to understand the ibis a little bit for a picture I was working on. So I'm just showing you these because I want to show you what, uh, that I don't work with any kind of construction at all. Uh, I just simply draw shapes the way I see them. And this, there's a kind of a rapidity that's required to do this kind of a thing. None, by the way, none, nothing I do, uh, even, even as a student, we were trying to draw more truthfully. Yeah, we tried to make the pictures more beautiful, but we're never trying to make the art drawing that, that sort of has become this thing today where everything is about fine art drawing. And it's, you know, historically, I've always liked drawings that are done for something. Uh, my favorite drawings are these studies for, you know, and like the Michelangelo, uh, one of the great paintings, uh, drawings of all time is for the Libyan Sybil. It's at the Met. Um, so that's just another use, but I'm just showing you that outline. You can do these much more rapidly if you can learn the line and then interplay of this line to that line and, and move through it. And I think that's, there's one more. Okay, yeah, that's the imaginative thing. Uh, so these are figures made up out of my head, and you can see in the left one where I'm try to, trying to sort it out, making marks and marks and marks. I'm going to show you this one again in the fleeting effects uh, video that's coming up, but... Um, uh, but this is a, this is not me trying to draw from anatomy. I'm just drawing shapes and responding and saying, that doesn't, they, arm wouldn't look like that. And I would have a memory because of three years of drawing the figure all day, all night. I'd have a memory of, of, of what figures can do. Some of which are, are relatively faulty or some parts unclear. And, uh, and, and yet uh, I find there's a way to get to, that looks better, that looks more like, and so on. Uh, but that's just shape making. I'm sorry, f figure drawing as if it was the way people talk about it all, over the t all the time, as if you had to make up your own figure. And I do that not infrequently. I'm, <laughs> I'm temp momentarily working on a, um, a theme of a, uh, just for the fun of it, uh, by the way, of a dragon. And so you can see all these attempts at dragon heads like this one here. And, <clears throat> and here's this figure, again, just made out of my head. Not, not much worked up, uh, just trying to get a decent sense of proportion and pose. And here's that figure again done small. I don't remember which came first. Probably the little one was a, an attempt to, to think about something about this one. But just any number of versions of the dragon's head uh, as this is the, you know, one of those slaying of the dragon kinds of things. Uh, so, John, that's, that's the story. I don't know what that means to anybody else. One pursues aspects and things about drawing because of what one's, one's inclination is. But I will say this about what I'm doing with line is that drawing the line the way you see it, learning that, getting that into your head is better than having construction drawing. And then finally, finally, finally later getting to that, that shape that you mean to say that you haven't had a chance to really explore a shape into other things. 
before you're exhausted. I mean, I'm saying that's one of the problems with the construction drawing is the tiredness. It, 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 it's the neural energy lost. So I'm a big recommender of this, but the second reason is because you want to, in, in, a, in an imagine, say, say a lost and found painting, you're still going to have the problem of articulating a sweet uh, contour. And to be able to, do, to have done this over and over again, not thinking about the figure, just beautifully thinking about shape and finding the shape. Uh, or wherever the shape shows up, that's going to show up. There's going to be a part of a painting that's going to be like that. And your ability to handle that with authority and uh, some uh, uh, confidence, what's the right word? Swagger, maybe. I don't want to use a word like that. But, uh, but you know what I mean? With authority, though, is really probably the fundamental thing. It's really going to be kind of big. So um, I hope that's helpful to people. You know, I'm, I'm not here to do anything more than just see if there's something in my past and you're, that, that tells you more about where I, where I am now. Be aware of this as an impressionist painter. You've seen my starts. I do not draw outlines of objects and, um, and then fill them in. I don't do that at all anymore. So you'd have to wonder if, if line drawing, which this is replete with, right? Most of this is based on line drawing, is um, if line drawing is really that helpful. And I have never, ever had a reason to regret any moment I spent with both line and shape. Uh, they are fundamental to all the art. You know, what Degas said, uh, uh, silhouette, it's all silhouettes. And uh, you know, the whole conversation about contours. Uh, but uh, if you understand that, the silhouette is, is shape making 101, right? Um, so. Get good at it, and there's thousands of ways to do it. Play with lines, draw lots of lines, I think was what Ang said to Degas, lots of lines uh, from memory and from nature, uh, depending on the versions of it. So I think that will do the job. Memory, memory from photographs, memory from photographs of paintings, memory from life. There's a little feeling of Degas there. Drawing from life and then learning, drawing afterwards from memory. Uh, to you know, see if you actually learned it. That really got me, by the way, in that moment there to go ahead and, and say, are you learning the figure or are you just sort of shoving everything over there and trying to get a figure to look right? That made a big difference in my mind to comprehend the figure is kind of the thing, right? Which causes you to have to comprehend the relationships of parts in various, in various uh, permutations. And by the way, for whatever it's worth, I, uh, I would take a regular paper, maybe even a watercolor paper, I don't know, but I would stain it sometimes just for fun. <laughs> and this is tea stained or coffee stained, who knows? Uh, and uh, just, just mentioning that, right? Um, but yeah, the memory, the, sort of the longer memory, just line oriented. Uh, the figure that stands still for a minute and then you draw uh, memory. The uh, 10 minute look. And these were never, we didn't do these twice. The guy held the pose for 10 minutes and we, that's all, what you got is what you got. And uh, fascinating, fascinating introduction to uh, uh, your own sense of confidence for one thing, your own fearfulness. And then secondly, to the possibilities. Uh, oh, I'm going the wrong way. Okay. Methods, first this, then that sort of approach from the mass. This is where the line into mass. You see, line is still important. Shape is still important, but it's not exclusive. We're not doing an outline. We're just doing, we're doing a silhouetting shape as we need it, another one as we need it, another one as we need it, right? And that's the sort of model that's different now uh, from the outline per se. And this is uh, oil drawing and uh, just more exercises, uh, you know, in search of uh, drawing skills and copying from Raphael. The... Um, the live model in pencil, three-day poses. Uh, so that would be nine hours or less of posing, uh, drawing. Standard for pencil for us. And um, charcoal drawing, which would have been three, two weeks, uh, nine hours, nine, nine days, or nine half days. And uh, drawing four paintings, charcoal drawing four paintings, preliminary drawings where we do the framing on the painting to, to find the right cropping. And then stretch a canvas to match that. And uh, then the old days, the Art Students League, where I started. So I think you've seen the picture. And uh, yeah, if it helps you, that's a great thing. <laughs> so I'll see, I'll see you in the next one. We can discuss various aspects of drawing another time, if you like. All right. Take care. Have a good painting week. Hey, by the way, oh, yeah, I can't forget to tell you. I'll, I'll see you all this Saturday. Don't forget, it's March 6th, and we're going to be on at 4. You better check your, what, what you see on the screen here in front of you. And 
and I'm looking forward to it. It should be a whole lot of fun. Um, be there with your questions, your discussion points, uh, uh, various ideas. Keep remembering, by the way, as you d come up with your ideas, uh, or and me be there, that who, who you're talking to, you know, because I'm, I'm not this guy who just wants to grandiosely talk about everything. I'm really talking about a very particular way of working. And um, you could say, of course I am, because it's my way of working, right? But I don't really like to pontificate on, I think somebody used that word recently, on the nature of painting and all sorts of, well, I do talk about that as my interpretation of it. But I'm not going to be this guy who's trying to be the defining person, the person who says, this is, this is, this is it, and not that, and all sort of thing. I'm just talking about how I work and uh, giving you uh, a, a review of the practices that I've found to work best over time. And from a point of view of a guy who's uh, done a lot of varieties of things, as you may see a little bit from there. All right, good. See you on... See you on Saturday.